Thanks for staying with us here on News Desk. We can bring you a lot more stories now. You can turn our attention to politics and the new patriotic parties. National Council has appointed former National Chairman Peter McMenu to lead the party's 2016 campaign team. McMenu's appointment was made at a crucial meeting of uh, National Council members on Wednesday. The party's flag bearer, Nanado Dankwe Kufado, had nominated uh, Mr. McMenu for the council's endorsement. Mr. McMenu has been leading the party's electoral reform agenda, working closely with the Electoral Commission. Also on the team is Member of Parliament for Okre and former General Secretary Dan Kwekubuche. Former Chief Executive of Data Bank, Ken Foyata, will lead the logistics team with support from party stalwart Boache Ejakon. We'll be bringing you much more on this and uh, we'll be trying to get an understanding as to what really this means for the party and uh, uh, how the dynamics are to be now moving forward. But uh, that will be subsequently on the show. And we can do some more now. And the curricula of our tertiary institutions is recklessly out of sync with the realities of the job market. Now, what is taught in schools is a huge disconnect from the experiences and requirements needed by employers in the country. Now, this, according to... The Minister of Agriculture, Fifi Fiave Kwete, is one of the major factors hindering Ghana's development. Speaking at the last session of the Ministry of Education's Campus Connect program at Ashesi University, the Greek Minister recounted his time as an economic student at the University of Ghana. I spent years in the university, and there were many times I asked myself, what am I actually doing in this place? Because, I mean, I just couldn't see why I was spending time here. Because the truth of the matter is that some of the things I was being told, taught, I'm like, where, where am I ever going to use any of this stuff you are teaching me? <laughs> and, and I'm right. I mean, I, I, did, I did economics in the University of Ghana. And later on, I had the privilege of working in an investment bank. And of course, a greater privilege of working in the finance ministry. And I tell myself, three years studying economics in the University of Ghana, excuse me, it was absolutely a waste of time. It was an absolute waste of time. <laughs> absolute lack of connectivity between what you were being taught and what the reality in the real world is. Yet, spent three years agonizing, waking up at dawn, doing all kinds of assignment and losing sleep. <laughs> you know? Because you felt if you didn't do that, you were not going to get a good grade. And if you didn't get a good grade, you couldn't get a good job. And if you didn't get a good job, so the obsession was not the fact that you love the subject matter. You just needed to pass in order to have a job. And that invariably has set a lot of our absolutely, should I call it, people who can transform our society into studying staff that they have no business studying in the first place. Because they have no real heart desire for the subject matter they were studying. And if the people don't love what they really are studying, there's no way they can reach the top. But I say it all the time that it's just like the human body. If you are not cut out to be in the stomach, if you spend your whole energy being in the heart, you are simply going to be wasting your time because that's not what you are born to achieve. My view is that this continent is having too many people operating in places they have no business operating. So is it perhaps time for a change in the country's uh, educational curricula to reflect industry's needs? Uh, we'll try and have a conversation around this. Joining me over the telephone lines now is an educationist, Ani Zafar, and he's, he's joining us to help us understand one or two things on this particular subject matter. Mr. Ani Zafar, if you can hear me, good morning. Many thanks for your time here on News Desk. Yes, I can hear you. Good morning to you. Great. So, uh, Perhaps we need to make some adjustments to our curricula. I mean, seeing that uh, quite a number of people are bringing this, uh, this particular issue up. And indeed, uh, uh, industries, those who seek to employ many of our graduates uh, who are just from the universities, uh, is that a fair assessment of uh, the country's educational system as things stand now? Right. You know, we are at an inflection point in education in this country. What that means is that we cannot continue doing the same old things and expect a different result. You know, many times, all that we do is get young people to memorize theories, and then we test them on theories. Those days are gone. We've been doing this since 1957. This is the year 2015. And we don't seem to be able to do anything in this country. We always have to import everything. So, the, and, you know, I don't know if you read my columns in a graphic every Monday. The focus is that. That 
we have to begin to reorient the minds of our young people from sitting in the classroom 24, I mean, sitting in classrooms so uh, many hours and convert that energy into projects. Now, this is what I mean. Look at a typical person who's uh, gone to the university. In the lower primary, they are sitting. Upper primary, they are sitting in classrooms. Junior high school, they are sitting in classrooms. Senior high school, they are sitting in classrooms. At the university level, they are still sitting in classrooms doing what? They are memorizing theories and then copying their theories back in exams for a certificate. These things are not working. One of the things that we have to do is that, especially even at the university level, we have to now begin to reorient the mindsets of the lecturers and professors themselves. That we have to begin to add value to Ghana's natural resources. That is very, very important. If you look at someone who's been sitting for 16 years, for a degree, and suddenly you release them into industry, how on earth are they going to perform? If you look at the lack of productivity in the civil service, it comes from this culture of sitting behind a desk for 16 years and then release someone for the first time to begin to work. It doesn't work like that. We are creatures of habit. And unless we understand that we learn through our hands, we learn by adding value to what we have. We're going to be in the same decrepit situation that we have. Now, my suggestion is this. Look at the burial districts in this country. We have over 200 districts in this country. All the districts are not endowed the same way. So now, the teachers themselves have to be taught how to begin to add value to the natural resources in that area. And the example I give is this. If you, have, uh, you are teaching in the north, for example, we have to learn how to add value to cotton so that we create a cotton industry. If you're teaching in the North, we have to learn how to add value to the cultivation of rice, so that it, we have rice industries there, and then we don't have people coming down in the South carrying things on their head. It's the same thing. If you look at the schools along the riverbank, science projects have to be directed there, where we are creating fish farms, because these are huge industries that gain employment uh, at the end of the day. But this business of sitting behind the desk, copying notes from the exercise, uh, from the textbook onto the chalkboard, copying it back from the chalkboard into the exercise books, memorizing it for the theories and getting uh, scores based on the academics, these things are not working in this country. And it will never work in this country. So, and then, the, go ahead. Yeah, Mr. Anisha, now, where exactly is this problem coming from? Is it from the ministry? Is it from uh, the the tertiary level, or where, where exactly, or probably from the students? You know, it's coming from everywhere. But we want to begin to look at those who set policy. The policy should be that for Ghana to advance from the third world into the first world, we need to bring the element of projects. We want to bring in the elements of scientific applications. These are the things that we have to consider all the time. And also, to be honest with you, the so-called lecturers and professors and the rest of them they have to begin to reorient their own mindsets to add them value to the courses that they are teaching in terms of tangible products that are functional for this country. Uh, are, they, are they not already doing that? Are, are the lecturers you speak of not already doing what you are asking them to do? Then why do we have the situation that we have? You know, let me tell you. Many times you go into the, some of the universities and they are using the uh, PA system to memorize, to copy, uh, to dictate notes for young people to copy so they can reproduce them for exams. I mean, those days are gone, you know? And also even when you begin to look at young people who are stealing exam questions, when you work on projects, you don't have, you have zero need to steal exam questions because it's your work that shows over a period of time where the assessments are done on what you yourself are doing. You have to begin to reorient the mindset of our children uh, in, in the education system. And check this. We have to shift from the cognitive abilities where all you do is um, uh, memorize things into what we call the affective competencies. Affective competencies simply means that we are going to get our young people now to be curious enough to learn to use their own imagination, to learn to use their own initiative, you know, so that there's a sense of purpose. And education, the quality education, has to be directed to the things that people are doing things that satisfy a certain curiosity in them. You know, this is, like I said at the beginning, we are at an inflection point in education in this country where we cannot continue doing the same things, but we continue doing the same things. It doesn't work. 
I'll give you one, uh, one last example. Where, and I, I don't know if I've told you this on your station, but where I was at Lagos, and we had to use the bathroom, the stench was so badly, so bad, that we had to leave because there was no water to flush the toilet. Now, when I walked out into the hallway, in, uh, there was a chamber. That was uh, a chamber in the walkway. That was broken. And water was spilling everywhere. We have 30,000 students at the University of Ghana. And the point, the point of this, we have right across the street, we have right across the road, we have the Department of Applied Sciences. If we cannot apply water from the chamber to flush our own toilet, then my goodness, what is the purpose of education? These are the things that we have to look at seriously. So Mr. that Mr. we Paul, develop so some sort of abilities to uh, enhance quality education in this country. I see. So do you, do you see the situation changing any time soon? I mean, looking at how uh, things are currently being done, uh, do, do you see any change any time soon? You know, what, what is, and I'm glad that you guys, you guys. Anissa, if, if you can hear me. Okay, well, okay, so that particular line has just uh, tripped there, and uh, uh, Anisa Fah is an educationist. He was helping us understand a few things about uh, the way and manner in which uh, the country's curricula is run as against the demands from uh, industry. So we'll try and uh, bring him back on the line to uh, get that particular, that particular part from him. But uh, away from that, we can switch back to politics. And the New Patriotic Party's National Council has actually appointed uh, Peter McMenno, that's the party's former general secretary, to lead the party's 2016 campaign team. McMenno's appointment was made at a crucial meeting uh, of National Council members yesterday, that is on Wednesday. So uh, joining me over the telephone lines now to help us uh, understand how really the dynamics of this is going to be like, how it's actually going to operate, is Dr. Ransford Jampo. He's a political scientist. He joins us live now by the telephone. Uh, Dr. Jampo, uh, good morning. Many thanks for your time here on his desk. Yes, good morning. So, uh, is it at all a surprise to see uh, Peter McMenu lead the party, lead the MPP's uh, campaign team? Um, come again. I, I I'm asking, is it at all a surprise to hear the MPP announce Peter McMenu as uh, the person to lead their campaign team uh, into uh, election 2016? Oh, I, I don't know, but... Um, um, the flag bearer of the party, I'm sure, has worked with uh, Mr. McMenu before. Um, he knows um, what he can do. And um, so if he decided to have him lead his campaign, I think so be it. Uh, mm. As to whether I'm surprised or not, I think it's, it's, it's immaterial. I mm. believe um, the flag bearer may have considered a lot of things um, in determining who must lead his campaign. So um, whoever he's ended up settling on, I mean, that's, that's his choice and all must be, or must be respected. Well, you know, usually what, what people say is that uh, getting a lot of quality players on board a particular team is actually good, but uh, finding a way to synchronize them, uh, getting them in tune, uh, is the best way of bringing the best out of them. Now, uh, seeing the list we have here, we have uh, Peter McMenu leading, and we have uh, Dan Botry, that's Member of Parliament for a Constituency, and also a former general secretary of the party, uh, also providing support to him. And uh, we do also have Ken Oforiata of Data Bank, as well as uh, Boachi Ejako, is being a former director of campaigns also for the party. Uh, how do you see this particular team, and how do you see them gelling? Well, these are, I will tell you, a galaxy of political staff. I mean, people who have have a niche for themselves, maybe apart from Ken Oferiata, who is uh, his own, uh, a professional business uh, person. I think the rest are uh, people who have achieved a lot and carved a niche for themselves um, and in Ghana's political landscape. And I, I believe they are competent enough to be able to um, help Nanado prosecute his campaign. But like rightly indicated, sometimes um, people who are good in themselves, people who have made it on their own, if you assemble them together, it becomes difficult for them to see who is who is hidden and who is who must play an ancillary role, who will play a core role and who can help um, um, in the peripheral of, of things. And so uh, uh, how they are able to gel, how they are able to coordinate activities, how they are able to all 
focus their eye on the ultimate objective of seeking to capture political power will be critical. Um, in my view, I think they all can do it, they all can lead, and, and all that. So it's important that um, they all put their efforts together and focus on and the ultimate objective of capturing political power. Mm -hmm. If they are able to do this, um, then it will be good for them. Otherwise, then there is always a tendency for one to assemble the best group of people, and yet with lack of coordination and understanding, they, then they may tend to achieve better. Doc, let me ask this question. I, I'm, I'm, I'm imagining how this is likely to play out. And we do have uh, someone like Dan Botre, who is a political strategist. Some say he's uh, on top of his game when it comes to uh, strategizing to win elections. Now, uh, he is rather to play a subsidiary role uh, as against someone like Mark Menno. Well, indeed, he also uh, is a strategist according to many. But really, uh, uh, how is that supposed to happen? For instance, if uh, someone like Dambochi comes up with this strategy, thinking that this might be the best way out, and he gets an opposing view from his uh, leader, in quotes, uh, uh, how does that play out? <laughs> well, like I said, that would not be to the benefit of the party. Hmm. Um, the two are all good in themselves. Like you said, they are all political strategies. And um, it's important that they gel. Um, otherwise, then, like I said, they would achieve little because uh, they are all captains. They all could be referred to as captains. And um, you can't have two captains in one ship. And all that. So, 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 uh, so, so from where you sit, uh, it's obvious there's going to be some sort of an issue. No, no, I don't that. think so. I mean, if they are all, I can't, I can't say there's going to be an issue. I'm sure whoever gave them their job description, whoever gave them the appointment, they have spoken to them about his ultimate objective and the purpose for which that appointment has been given. And so um, the advice, it's only a we can advise that, look, you would have to, you are all good, but you have to work together. And it, it should be a team a team a team play um kind of spirit it shouldn't be somebody trying to show that well i can do this more and this one can do that and all that so the, the point is um left if they are left on their own i think um uh, without advice or without helping them focus on the core objective then some of these problems may come mm. up but um if they are able to be encouraged to work together Okay. And all that. At the, at the end of the day, it's not about Dambuchi being a master strategist. It's not about um, Victor McMahon being a former national chairman before. But it, it's about how the MP fare in the 2016 elections. That's what what matters. So if everybody will be able to put um, their their talent and bring, put their resources, put their brains together mm. to work for one purpose. At the end of the day. I think it would yield to the party's benefit. The MPP must play a role as a credible alternative. MPP must show itself as being prepared adequately to be able to take over the mantle of leadership. It must it must look credible in the sight of Ghanaians. For the for the party to be able to attain these things, um, it would also be contingent on how effective this um, this team is able to play. Uh, uh, its rule to augment mm. and the campaigning of, of the flag bearer. Great. Uh, doc, doc, finally, before you go, uh, we do know that these four are to be the driving force of uh, the, the party's campaign uh, into election 2016. Now, uh, along the line, do you think it will be relevant to possibly recall some of the members who have been uh, already suspended by the party? I mean, people like uh, Mr. Paul Afoku, for instance, uh, do have huge followings in the party. He did win uh, elections in the National Congress. Well, that is, you are talking about something different. I mean, I, I completely disagree with the uh, sanctions that have been placed on them. And I've said it so, at several forums. Uh, but um, it seems, um, well, the MPP um, knows what is best for them. And I don't want to also pretend to be wiser than them. But in my view, like rightly indicated, in politics, you always have people who, who, who are loud and the hawks and all that these people are always heard, and they are always heard um, um, being opinionated on issues and all that. And then you have also people you refer to as a silent majority. There are people who don't talk, but they may favor one cause or the other. My point is that without any empirical study, you may not be able to know 
whether um, um, Afuku and Kwabri Japon um, have also majority of supporters behind them uh, or not. But my view is that definitely they may have some following um, behind them. And given what may have, what has happened to them, there is a likelihood that they may not even come up to talk and all that. And when that happens, um, in the coming election, it will be difficult for them to vote for the NDC, that I must say. But it would also be difficult for them to also vote for their own party, given what may have happened to the people um, that they look up to. And so my point is that a bear can fly with one ring, but it will not go far. A bird must fly with both wings. And so um, they have been sanctioned. Now everybody knows that um, there is power in the party and um, the crypt will be cracked if, if you go afoul of the rules of the party. I mean, looking at um, the charges that were leveled against um, Japan and Afroku, clearly they may have run afoul of some of the party rules. Um, they've been sanctioned, in my view, if they are recalled um, to come and play a rightful role in the campaign, it will help the party. There is always a way of managing um, conflict. There is always a way of keeping, keeping an eye on people who are perceived to hold different agenda from that of the common um, uh, agenda that everybody looks up to. Mm. And so, in my view, if... Um, uh, it is suspected that um, some people have agenda. You can manage them and you can keep an eye on them in such a way that you will be able to tap some, some part of their potentials and harness um, those potentials for your own good, whilst but, at the same time keeping an eye on, on them to prevent them from undermining uh, the, the common but, but again, suspending them, one would say, is also a, a form of management. You are managing them in a way. Or you think that, that, that was yeah, not the right the, approach? Ma, ma, but the point is that they have followings within the party, and there okay. may be people in the party who may not want that, uh, who, may not, who may disagree with their suspension. And the point is, um, I've always argued that, you see, MPP has, may have four, 5 million core supporters, NDC may have 5 million core supporters, now, the rest is floating voters. What is happening is what has happened in the NTP now would mean that some of the core supporters of the party may, may feel alienated. And so whilst NDC keeps intact its core supporters of 5 million, MPP may be working against or will be, in quotes, eating into its own 5 million um, core, uh, core supporters. And mm -hmm. it may not help. In addition, if is not taken and some of these things are not properly resolved for the party to demonstrate peace or for people to see that there is peace in the party then the party may also not be endearing itself to floating voters and that is not that wouldn't be helpful okay. and so the point is that yes these people have been supported uh, have been suspended and um, i think the flag bearer may want to play a leading role here in ensuring that look um they are warned and, rec and, and recall from their suspension. If it is necessary for people to render apology, um, they should be made to render apology. And those who will be called upon to render apology must also not demonstrate pride. I mean, they should just accept it and apo um, apologize. And all should be brought on board. Like mm -hmm. I said, you cannot fly and go high on, with one, with one, one, ring, wing. one ring at the back. Right. Many thanks for your time on Newsdesk and, uh, well, you can't fly on one wing, really. <laughs> and uh, those were the words of uh, Dr. Rans Pojampo. He's a political science lecturer with the University of Ghana. Uh, time now for us to check out the very latest in business when we come back from this break with Imano Abuajiriafe.